installed the updated Zoom. So there we go. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast today. And we have a very special guest joining us from uh, over in Monaco, which is a place I'd absolutely love to go. A guy called Simon Dolan that, as I've just mentioned before recording, it'd be absolutely amazing just to talk solely about business side of things. But this is a guy that is going up against the UK government, essentially in a judicial review, can't even say the word, for unlawful lockdown, essentially. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Um, There's three different sort of tenets to the argument, but yeah, it's it's that it's unlawful and that it's disproportionate. Exactly. So we'll, we'll dive into that. But first off, I want to just thank you for taking some time out to to join me here on the podcast and obviously you're, you're a very busy guy with all the businesses you've got. Yeah, even a bit busy with the businesses, but even more busy now with this, uh, with the whole court case going on. So yeah, keeps me out of mischief though. Definitely, definitely. So you've, you've had quite an interest in reading through your book. Uh, it was released a few years back. Uh, it's the worth I've actually seen has gone up since then. So it was like 70 million. Then on the website is a hundred million. And I think on Wikipedia it's 142 or something like that. So you've been pretty successful over, over the years, more, more than the average person. But the book you actually released was talking about how to be a millionaire without a degree, essentially, without going to university. And so you've started off with, what was it, selling scratch cards at 13, um, paper round in a hospital, cheese and egg stall, then going to accounts, even a bit of timeshare selling, which uh, by, by the sounds of it wasn't the most successful with getting you in debt, um, selling photocopiers <laughs> and fax machines. Uh, you've, you've done yeah, a certainly lot. I've done quite a bit, learnt quite a lot. You know, I learned probably more in those couple of years selling timeshare and photocopiers and fax machines than, I, than I've learned, you know, probably doing any kind of academic type stuff, you know, accounts and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, it was, it was all valuable. You know, you, when you do this stuff, you never know quite where it's going to end up. It all goes in the melting pot, doesn't it? And then it seemed to pop out all right on the other side. Exactly. And looking at that as well, I was actually um, chuckling a little bit of the story you talk about being being Rambo with breaking out after the um, drinking <laughs> session and then going back into like you're in a cell, you broke out because they left the door open and then tried to get back in as well. Um, yeah, genuinely, genuinely true that. <laughs> and I couldn't, I, they wouldn't actually let me back in because it'd full up by that time. So I had to sit on the bench outside, uh, uh, you know, in, outside the cell. That's, yeah. that's pretty crazy. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in your book. So it's, it's one of the. Yeah, yeah I forgot all about it. To be <laughs> and, and also, like, talking about the Davy Bowie aspect of get on with it as well. The G O W I, the GOI. And I think yeah. that's something which, which actually has resonated a lot when it comes to lockdown. and we can talk like about your history and things like that. Um, I'd love to dive into the racing side of things because um, winning the Mon 24 hours is quite an achievement in itself. But let's get on to the lockdown side of things because you're going up against what is it? Your the judicial review is going up against the government. Do you want to just say what are the main points that we're looking at with regards to that and the lockdown here in the UK? Yeah, so a judicial review is just simply a mechanism for, for challenging the government and seeing whether what they've done is actually legal. Um, so that's what we're doing. And we sent them a letter before action. Uh, it's a couple of weeks ago now. It's all been a bit of a blur, but what would that be? Sort of start of May. And, uh, and, it, and it lays out our case, which is that the, they acted outside the law um, and that it was disproportionate. So what they, you know, the lockdown... Uh, is disproportionate to the to the threat, and uh, and also that it's a basic infringement of a, of a of an English common law right, which is the right to enjoy um, private property peacefully. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that, that was where we're at, and and you know we just literally just had the letter back from the uh, from the government responding to that uh, like five minutes before we went on air. So. Uh, yeah, I need to read it and digest it, and the lawyers and the barrister are, but it will all start getting pretty exciting in the next week or so, I think. Definitely, and what uh, people have asked me with regards to this, and obviously, you know, that being in Monaco, you, you've got people telling, I mean, I saw a post on yours saying like, oh great, you're paying no tax in Monaco and stuff like that, and all the crowdfunding, it's kind of people thinking that um, 
they're able just to like take digs at that. You're actually paying business tax over there. It's just personal tax, I believe. But um, if that's correct, but um, yeah. Oh, so all my businesses are in the UK. All, all, almost all the businesses are in the UK. Yeah, and they they're all subject to UK tax. So the the whole um, you're in Monaco and don't pay any tax is is, is a bit of a ridiculous argument. Yeah, um, what, but what, yeah, there's a few people who said it, but it's not. Sorry, um, what I was getting to with that is that the crowdfunding side of things, people are thinking that this is all being funded by crowdfunding, but that's what just over a hundred thousand pounds now. Yeah, I wish it. I wish it was all being funded by crowdfunding. I'll tell you why that the, the crowdfund came about in the first place. When I started this, I got in touch with a barrister, and uh, and the idea was was I was just going to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of personal. And then he said, well, I've got somebody else who's interested in also doing it. So uh, a lady called Erica. So I got in touch with her and said, you know, if you fancy putting some money in, then you know, do that. So she did, you know, quite, quite a lot of money. And then um, she was saying, well, I've got some friends who, who also might like to put some money in. And then the solicitor that we were using said, well, we, you know, we can't, if it's going to be smaller amounts, the solicitor can't accept donations, you know, here, there and everywhere. They just haven't got the manpower to do it. Yeah. So he said, why don't you set up a crowd, uh, crowd justice, it's called. But why don't you set up a crowd justice page? So that was a reason for doing it, really. It was just more for, for sort of friends to put, you know, some money in. And it was just an ease of admin with, uh, with a solicitor. And, and then it just sort of took off. And it's, it's actually really heartwarming. I'm really glad we did it because I think there's 3,500 people have donated. And most people put some sort of comment on. Uh, and they're really lovely, you know just comments of support and comments of, you know, so glad somebody decided to do it. And you know, there's a lot of ill feeling, but of course, most people haven't got the, um, the wherewithal to be able to, to do what I'm doing in terms of the judicial review. So, you know, the fees for doing it is going to be, you know, anywhere from about probably 250,000 to, you know, somewhere close to a million if it goes uh, to Supreme Court, which it probably will. So uh, yeah, we, the, the crowdfund is lovely. But it's uh, it's certainly going to be me that's had the lion's share of paying for it, and which what, is fine. Yeah, I don't problem. Yeah, I, I mean, like people obviously choosing to, and I think the support side of things. You've obviously had a massive amount of people against it as well, uh, from just looking at your Twitter side of things. As I said, that person saying you're not paying tax in Monaco, or you know, I, I've heard you've had death threats as well. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Less so now, actually. I must say that in the last week, the tides really turned. So you do still get a few, uh, a few sort of, uh, you just, it's more now you get people disagreeing rather than people being abusive. So that's changed. In the, in the early days, it was really abusive. Not many, but you know, some. And now it's, it's almost, it's overwhelmingly positive and there's just a few that are still hanging around. And, uh, and I think the few that are hanging around generally tend to be bots anyway. You, know, you look at profiles and they have some weird bios and the language is quite weird. So, um, yeah, I, I take no notice of it. I don't care if they're real or not. I mean, what is it? It's words on screen. It's not going to kill me. So. Exactly. It's, um, it's something which I've noticed on, like, going through social media. And, okay, I'm not as, like, to the level that you are with, with social media and the interaction with people there. But when you have certain views on certain things, and I've come through the health side of things, and people will say their view is exactly right, and they'll have their opinion. And everyone's entitled to their opinion, right? But why take it out on someone else and like, mm. just just as when i posted uh, a question and answer or a questions post earlier with regards to asking you questions and someone puts a statement up rather than a question just saying you're an idiot you think oh great so that's very very constructive there um and it seems that a lot of times with people on social media i've noticed they probably wouldn't say these things to your face especially knowing that oh, cool. you're a kickboxing champion right yeah so <laughs> It'd be pretty stupid yeah. to say that. It, it would be really fascinating, wouldn't it, to, to just, you know, whoever it is, to just put a troll in a room with the person that they're trolling. And you almost guarantee, I reckon, nine times out of ten, they probably actually end up getting on. It's just yeah. simply that you're sat behind the computer and in, in your mind, you're building up a picture. And so with me, you know, Monica, oh, it's this rich arsehole that's abused people and uh, clawed his way to the top and stamped all over, you know, the, the sort of image that people have. Of, uh, have made money some people and they just build this picture up in their head and they convince themselves that that's true and then they'll tap it out you know as though it is true 
like I say, if you uh, if you actually met them, they'd probably be all right, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's something I've noticed with just the the low level of um, following that I've got. So let's let's go into what was the first thing that you noticed wasn't quite right about lockdown, apart from the fact we had a full lockdown. But what was the first thing you thought? Hang on, something doesn't add up here. The the numbers. Yeah. So it's just basically that it just it, it it was the numbers weren't that great and still aren't that great in terms of you know, averages over the course of the last 20 years or so. And so I couldn't quite work out why, you know, you're having this massive and unprecedented um, government interference in life. Yeah. For something that really isn't out of the ordinary. What's out of, ordin- what's, what's out of the ordinary is, is the way that the media have, uh, have reacted to it and the way the government have manipulated people into believing that it's this uh, thing that's going to kill them if they step out their front door. Um, so that's what's extraordinary about it, not the virus itself, it's just another virus, like a trillion of them on the planet. Some of them kill us, some of them don't. You know, it's, it's just part of life. Well, exactly, and, and also viruses, they need to mutate in order, well, they want to survive. So they're going to mutate into uh, less dangerous, like weaker strains if we have some sort of herd immunity. We look at the flu, when the flu first came out, it probably had quite a big, like, hit on people who hadn't been exposed to it in, in the past like with their immune function and looking at the numbers and the frustrating thing that i mean i'm going to put my opinion in here is that the media aren't saying the numbers that are freely available to the public i've clicked on a link here and um, if anyone wants a link drop me a message to the nhs website talking about people with pre-existing conditions and who are not having pre-existing conditions so they're literally when we look at under 59 years old the people that have died that have a pre-existing condition whatever they actually define that as on the nhs because when we look at obesity or immune disease um, diabetes and these sorts of things they're pre-existing conditions there's only 207 people under 59 as of 5 p.m on the 5th of may according to the nhs websites and these are hospital deaths without a pre-existing condition that have died and there's 1554 with a pre-existing condition so, and then obviously you go higher and higher in, in the or older and older in the age groups. Yes, there's still people dying at high numbers, but they're with pre-existing conditions. Do you, do you see that with the media, has there been a frustration with them not saying these numbers, obviously? Well, I mean, they're just clickbait headlines, aren't they? Mm. Uh, the, the headline, there's so much um, competition out there for, for eyes on stories. That they get they become more and more dramatic and, and obviously if you uh, you know daily mirror run an article that said uh, fifty thousand people are going to die on easter sunday it would have got loads of hits yeah it was completely made up but it would have got loads of hits um so you know it's, that's just the way the media works you know you have to have a, a headline that stand, stands out and jumps out and the headlines that people tend to click on are the um, are the most sensational ones and especially if they're ones that are threatening your your health you or your family, your loved ones or whatever. And as humans, I think you've got, pro- you've got far more of a propensity to believe the bad news than you have the good news because it's your survival instinct. You know? So that yeah, kicks in. I, I actually think the government have, have done a fantastic job in brainwashing people. And I think they've done too good a job. And I don't think they're particularly excited about how good a job that they've done because now you can't get people back to work. You can't get people back to work. You can't get uh, the unions are saying, well, you know, you told us we're all dying last week. What's changed? No, no, no. We need to be, you know, where every workplace has to be uh, basically unworkable, um, you know, two meters apart and uh, screens around everybody and tape and this and that and the other. And, uh, and of course, the government will just say, well, we said you could, you could reopen. You just needed basic safety precautions. If you can't run your business, well, that's tough. It's down to you. It's not our fault. Now, that, that's going to be what's happening. I can tell you that. Definitely. I think with the support that people have given out, not only uh, or the people that the government have uh, apparently given out, which I'm certain is going to come back in taxes and everything in the future when it comes to obviously bounce back loans have to be paid back. But the self-employed side of things, is that going to be extended? There's hints that it won't be extended. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if it doesn't get extended, people are going to have to go back to work, right? they're not just going to be able to sit at home and like legally they maybe can't but for example myself being in the health world 
my business is online, working with entrepreneurs in health all online, but still get into the gym, they need to be able to do some training side of things and have access to some sort of facilities to get a very, very good workout. We've mm. all done home workouts and um, I don't know what equipment you have, whether you have a full gym access, you, the lockdown's been raised over there, as you said, but home workouts aren't quite the same as actually going to the gym, getting your sweat on and then coming home and getting on with your day of work fully energized. And people aren't going to wait as August, September, October. But when we actually look at taking the numbers out of it, and this is something I've like dug into a lot with regards to my own side of things, because previously I've had mental health problems. I say mental health problems, panic attacks, anxiety, and things like that. Ironically, when I used to work in the corporate world, um, in the insurance industry, and eating disorders when I competed in bodybuilding and this sorts of things, if this was eight, nine years ago, then I wouldn't be handling it as well as I am now. And mm. there's going to be a lot of people in that situation that they get their release from exercise, to exa for example. And uh, for me, people haven't really understood the implications of, okay, in a gym, like, there's going to be a lot of people. Social distancing is hard to do in a gym. But you're not saying that alcohol um, should be banned or anything like that. But alcohol off lights is just still being kept open and like what are the implications you have seen like when it comes to the actual health problems of lockdown personally myself i've seen two people that i know of that have actually committed suicide so, so far uh, not close friends or anything just that i know of but what other uh, problems have you seen with having the lockdown on right now i think it's a story yet to be told isn't it um mm. And it, it'll be tragic. I've only seen things, you know, on social media and so on about uh, people committing suicide and so on. But it, it stands to reason that if you if you lock people up and you know vulnerable people don't see anybody, that's that's going to be what's going to happen. Um, I think that's probably the tip of the iceberg. I think when you think about all of the cancers and the heart disease and the strokes and everything else that's gone on, when people are now too scared to go to hospital or can't go to hospital and get tests and get diagnosed, you know, how many people will die of cancer in a couple of years' time that could have been prevented if they'd have got uh, diagnosed and treated earlier? So, um, you know, and that's just one small part of it. If you then, you know, knock it on to uh, worldwide figures. Um, you know, all of these people, that not, just, not in England, but, um, but around the world, there's an awful lot of people, third world, people from the third world that go into first world countries to work, mm -hmm. and then they send money back home, which is what they used to live on in their village. Well, that's not happening anymore because there's no money. So, you know, you look at that knock-on effect, that'd be huge. Um, I read something the other day about they're expecting a million and a half people to die of TB. Why? Well, because they can't get the t TB jabs anymore because no one can go and visit them. So it's massive, you know, the health. So I, I think it's, you know, it's kind of almost the Western world bit is the small bit of the health problem, but I do think it will magnify out across uh, the world as a whole. Um, but even from my point of view, you know, I've, I've been working out since I was 14, so that's a long time now. Um, and like you say, you know, I've been going to the gym since that time. I probably, in all that time, is probably the longest I've never been to the gym. It's probably about 10 days or something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now, you know, when you, you just can't go to a gym, it's okay, I go running a lot and so on, but then all of a sudden the running around Monaco, you're only allowed to in a, in a certain part, so then you're running loops rather than going up mountains and stuff. And it's gradually got closed in and closed in and closed in. And you ask what equipment I've got, well, I've got one kettlebell, uh, one dumbbell, um, and a mat. And I think that's, that's, that's it, actually. You know, and so you just have to kind of make it up. But even I, you know, I struggle with um, with getting motivated to do it. You know, in, in your bedroom, and there's a weight there, or you can go and go in the kitchen and have a porridge or something like that. Oh, yeah, I do my I do my workout tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. So yeah, yeah but that's a very small. You know, that's just me basically being lazy. Um, but yeah, it's going to be it's going to be multiplied across the board, isn't it? So I think the, the health ramifications are huge. Vitamin D, you know, people can't get outside. Vitamin D is is, is a big thing for immunity. Um, which the government don't recognise, but um, but we all know it is, and, uh, and people can't get outside in the sunshine. Well, what's that going to do to them? You know? What does it do to kids developing? Kids in playgrounds, you know, who are two and three years old or four years old, who used to go and see their mates and interact with other people, sort of takes six months of their development away. Well, six months for us is not a hugely long time, but six months when you're three years old is, you know, 
I don't know, 30% of your life. No. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. It's, it's massive of that. And uh, um, the thing that, I mean, I, I've seen people, obviously, they're, they're on their own as well. Like with me, luckily, I've got my wife here and um, she's working from home and all these sorts of things. But she had a, a call with someone this morning um, with the company she's worked with. They're actually trying to speak to elderly people and get them to actually access Zoom. She was on there for about two hours and I don't know how she had the patience to, to go through it, bless her. She didn't actually get onto Zoom in the end. It was just trying to put a password. They were trying to put a password in and then this person was trying to tell her the password. Don't tell me the password. But you think of the elderly as well. They're all on their own. With the access to technology, we all take for granted. That they don't necessarily understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to feel more and more isolated. And when we talk about elderly as well, the death certificate thing has been frustrating me a lot. I've heard so many different stories personally from friends all around the world uh, that have been put in COVID as a, the reason of death. Uh, and for what reason or another, one story I heard actually in New York that a guy that had uh, helped out as a fireman, emergency guy in 9-11, and he had cancer and he actually died and it is going to be a case that is down as COVID-19. If he died with cancer, which he was terminal, which he did die of, that he would have, his family would have got support purely because of the 9-11 side of things. And now as a result, mm -hmm. because he died of COVID-19, his family's not getting any support. And you think mm -hmm. there's going to be hundreds of cases like that in the U US and these are cases in the UK where it's, it's horrible just to think of that. Well, I think you think, well, if this, you know, if this, pandemic which it no longer is but you know when it was a pandemic why do they need to inflate the death numbers you know if it's that bad why do they need to inflate them and they are inflating them you know it used to be reported these people died off covid and then because they got pulled up on it so much it, they changed it without telling anybody to say these people died with covid and there's a big difference and and when you look at the data i think the average comorbidities were there were two point seven, so that would be you know heart disease, cancer, and something else, and COVID. I mean, there was a brilliant one in um, in Vegas, and there was a guy. There was a show called Sea Creed and Roy uh, years ago, a uh, very famous show, and the guy died, and he was seventy six, and they said he died of COVID. Well, this is the guy who in two thousand and three nearly had his head bitten off by one of the tigers. He also had HIV and he had heart disease and he died of COVID. You know, it, it's nonsensical. Why do they do it? I don't know. Part of me, you know, thinks, well, okay, then if, the, uh, if they haven't had a test and the doctor who's certifying the death is not sure what killed them, then you could make the argument that, well, if they all went to the coroner's office, it would rack up the coroner's office and there wouldn't be room. So what they've done is to say to them, I've seen the, the, the guidance. What they say to them is if you suspect COVID, or if they have any of the symptoms of COVID, then just list it as COVID-19 on the death certificate, because presumably it prevents you know, too many going to the coroner. Um, but the only problem with that is, is one of the, um, uh, one of the symptoms of, of COVID is obviously shortness of breath. Well, someone who's dying is generally short of breath. You know, it, it's, and it sounds funny, but it, it's the truth. For me, that doesn't, doesn't really make any sense at all. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's a mess. And I don't know whether it's something that the government have dug themselves into and now can't really find a way out without, you know, looking stupid. And so now they're trying to save face and give this very scientific looking 60 page plan for how we get out of this. You know, it, it took five minutes to get in it. Why is it taking three months to get out of it? It's yeah, exactly. switch on, switch it back off again. But even mm -hmm. then, like, when this all started, I think it was the 19th of March, there was a government guideline saying that coronavirus wasn't, it was the emergency was actually stepped down. Have you seen that? Was that true? Yeah, it was no longer a highly, um, highly yeah. infectious disease. Yeah. And that hasn't been anywhere on mainstream media that I've seen. So before we go into None the of it makes four days before. Yeah, none of it makes any sense. You know, the, the R number has been below one since about then. It actually went down from two and a half to below one when they gave the guidance about washing your hands. Actually, what they should have done is, is just basically say, look, wash your hands. There is this nasty thing going around. Try not to, you know, touch anybody. 
And if you're over 70 and you're poorly, then really you should stay indoors. If they'd have done that, would have had exactly the same effect, I would imagine. Uh, maybe even better effect because they would have put more um, emphasis on the care homes rather than just you know, slinging infected people back in the care homes to, to wipe them out. Um, but they didn't, you know, and it's all very easy with hindsight to say, you know, why you would have done things different. But I suppose the purpose of the case really is not to investigate, you know, what they did wrong then, other than it being outside of the law. It's how we get out of it now, you know. Um, so hopefully, you know, ne next week we'll be getting somewhere with it. Yeah, ho hopefully it is a case that things are raised pretty quickly once they, like, admitting you've done something wrong, it, it takes a lot, a lot of balls to do that, like it's a lot of guts and to say you've done something wrong, but it actually gains some respect for, for people. If you can admit you've done something wrong, for me anyway, if someone tells me they've done something wrong and they are like actually sorry about it, then okay, it depends on the level of going something wrong and this is pretty extreme, but they would, in my eyes, save some, some faith by actually doing that. I think, I think so, but I've never in my life heard a politician say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. True. Never. I don't think I've ever heard one admit that they were wrong. They'll, they'll apologise if circumstances meant that. And they'll, they'll have a very vague apology about something. They'll never, ever admit my ability. Ever. Never heard it. Yeah. What he should be saying is, look, I was Prime Minister. It was on my watch. Uh, we should have done things differently, but let's crack on and let's go, you know, not give these ridiculous speeches about you know, kind of blitz spirit and you've done so well and protect the NHS. You're not protecting the NHS, you're screwing the NHS. Yeah, absolutely screwing it because there's going to be no tax money to pay for anything in the future. They're already talking about freezing public sector pay. So we're all clapping for the nurses on Thursday night and the government is saying, yeah, we can't have any more money though. We haven't got any. It's not saving the NHS, is it? Um, so, no, I agree with you, but it wouldn't happen. Hill would freeze over before they ever admit that. Exactly, exactly. And Let's talk about the sports side of things because uh, very interested and in, in not necessarily got the time to talk about it today with the, the racing, how you got into the racing and then doing the Mans 24 hours. Um, I'm a big Formula One fan as well. So living in Monaco, I'm certain that you have probably bumped into or have a few of the Formula One drivers as friends. It'd be great to talk about that. But what are the implications long term on sport? And I know people think sport is this high funded uh, business and there's loads of money in it but as well long-term implications I mean I'm, I'm a Man United fan and I live in Norwich I was born in 1986 so that explains the glory hunter side which is not really glory at the moment so finishing the season without relegation would be kind of good for Norwich right now and no championship that's a bit of a bias because of Liverpool and side of things but um, are any sports would you feel are benefiting off this or Things like that at all? Well, esports. I, I don't classify them as a sport, but you know they, 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 it's got sport in the title, hasn't it? So anything else? I mean, what? No, there's no sport allowed. I mean, I've got a mate who's a, a tennis player, uh, a professional tennis player, and he, he's obviously not played. Well, you can't think of anything much. You're, you're like a really long way apart when you're playing tennis, and there's two of you, and there's no one else allowed. You know, no coaches, no nothing. Um, so why can't they play behind closed doors at least? But exactly. they're, they're just nothing, you know. It doesn't that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of for choice. If if let people go and do what they want to do. So if there's a football match going on and you want to go and watch, go watch. There's not a person in the country that doesn't know that there's a risk of you know catching something that could be nasty. So if you're willing to take that on the chin, go take it on the chin. Go watch your football game. You know, go and watch, uh, go and watch the racing. Go and watch whatever it might be. Safe in the knowledge that, in all likelihood, you're not going to get anything. Um, and if you do get something, it will be probably quite minor. You know, you're probably not going to die of it unless you're really vulnerable um, and old. In which case, you probably wouldn't be going to a football match anyway. So um, I, I don't, I don't get that. I don't get that. And they come up with it that you know, or you could be asymptomatic and you could be sat next to someone. Yeah, I get that. But that's the same anyway. You could you know, I could, be, I could be sat next to someone with, the, with Ebola. You know, I don't know that they haven't got it. Um, so that, that's life. You can get infected with stuff. And equally, you could be sat on a train and someone, you know, he, he might be schizophrenic and he stabs you in the head. <laughs> what do you do? It's just life. So, um, ah, di digress there, sport. Um, sport will come back, for sure. 
uh, in what state, uh, I don't know. Um, so I don't have too many worries about that. It, it is interesting how uh, how much you miss it though. I don't watch a huge amount of sport. I've noticed. I do like it from time to time. Like like you, I watch the F1, and it's uh, it's quite a bit of a void, isn't it? Exactly. And like the Melbourne Grand Prix was about to go on, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. and watch the qualifying 6 a.m. for the race. And you're like, oh, I'm actually not able to watch it now. And it was just straight on with it. And we're now seeing different stories about drivers changing and they haven't even officially started this season yet and they're already knowing who they're driving for next season which yeah. um, I'm a Ricardo fan I think the McLaren will be a good try would have been better but McLaren would have been was a good choice for him but completely digressing with that uh, lastly before I go into some of the questions that we've had asked um, talking about the gym side of things the couple of weeks before lockdown over here in the UK I don't know what it was like over there it was kind of like social distancing was happening anyway because people were doing that, uh, taking responsibility for themselves. And if they didn't want to go out, they weren't. But we, we kind of need, it's not going to happen, but we need the media to stop spreading these clickbait headlines. And we're both, you're obviously successful with marketing, um, pushing with, with my content and everything and getting headlines. We know the value of a headline, but we need the media to stop spreading the fear uh, because we know that, People have alcohol, high levels of junk food and obesity. All these things are going to make them feel more anxious and make them actually fear more, which fear breeds more fear, breeds more fear. Uh, so do you feel that the media would ever take that responsibility? Or have you noticed any journalists that we can follow that are spreading the good news? Uh, well, there's an awful lot. I mean, I would say almost all of the mainstream media now is on site you know is pro us pro lifting the lockdown um the only, the problem is is the readership you know they're, they're, there's a lot of people when they do polls and so on they're still quite happily sat on their ass doing nothing presumably because they're getting their furlough check or exactly. they're unemployed anyway or they were retired and you know and they, they don't particularly want the world going back to being noisy and busty um and who knows maybe it's being entirely manipulated uh, the polls that, that wouldn't surprise me at all but every journalist i've spoke to and i've spoke to a all of them, bar BBC, actually, strangely enough. Well, not strangely enough. Yeah. Um, and they've all been on site, absolutely every one of them. It, per, from a personal point of view, they've all been on site. And then when the pieces come out in the media, uh, they're all on site as well. Yeah, even The Guardian, which is normally uh, is against people like me, not me in particular. Um, but they were completely on site. That was one of the first ones I did. So I, I, I'm not so sure it's, it's the mainstream media. It's probably more the social media stuff, I think, they're... Uh, you know, and the, the good job that the government have done in terms of um, conditioning people, you know, this whole, um, uh, you know, stay at home, save lives, protect the NHS. You know, I've got a PR company and we do loads of stuff for loads of big companies. And that would, that would be a, an award winning campaign. That is such a good line. I don't know where they, where they got it from, it would be an agency, I guess. But, um, but it was brilliant and it scared the life out of people and it's made people feel as though they are actually really helping by sitting at home. Stay at home, save lives. It's brilliant. And protect the NHS, my God. And we'll pay you for doing it. Oh, all my Christmases have come at once, you know. Um, and now, of course, you've got to try and get out of it. And they go, well, hang on a minute. I'm staying at home to save lives. I'm still getting my furlough check, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll talk October now. Great. All right, I go back. Yeah, I'm happy to at home and save a life. And they feel virtuous because of it. And then when their mate down the pub, well, not down the pub anymore, of course, when their mate on Zoom says, um, well, I really ought to get back to work, it's, well, how dare you? You're killing people. You're actually killing people. I can't believe it. I'm not going to be your mate anymore. You know, social, social ostracization. Um, so, you know, it's, it's almost like the, uh, the silent majority, isn't it? I think the people, I think there's more, far more people would like it lifted than not. But it just seems to be that those ones get more weight, you know, the, uh, the stay at homers tend to be more violent, don't they? It's like the whole uh, transgender things. You know, 99% of people never believe the word of it, but they had enormous uh, media coverage. And it became a hate crime to say that a man wasn't a woman or vice versa or whatever, you know? So, I don't know. It, it, seems, it seems manipulated to me. Definitely. And like, even, even when we look at the, the sage notes as well, I believe at the start, there was talk about how to manipulate behavior and persuasion, right? Was that correct? 
Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's that comes straight from. You can download it. It's on the um, it's on the government website. Oh, I'm sure people will be able to find a link just to the Sage Notes. They released a load of them, and one of them was a manual on um, yes, how, how to manipulate the public basically into believing it. And, and there was a line on there which I tweeted. I can't quite remember what it was, but it was basically uh, scaring the public by using uh, hard hitting uh, emotive language or something like that via social media. And then you, you know, if you want to go deeper down it, there's the um, uh, the psychops division of the uh, of the British Army. So there's a 70, 77th Battalion of the British Army, which I only found out like a week ago, and uh, and they've got three or four thousand people on the psychological part of doing this. Wow! And social media will be part of that. And they they've been, you know, the, the commander of the, uh, the British Army was on boasting about it at one of the press conferences. Um, and saying we've got three or four thousand people on it, and we've had up to twenty thousand people on it. And they're only you can go on, the, on their website, seventy seventh Battalion, and check it out. And that's what they do. That's simple, that, that's just all they do: the psychological manipulation of, uh, of uh, the masses. So um, yeah, it's it's a bit scary, really. That is absolutely nuts. Like rather than going from physical war, they're actually doing virtual war on on the masses, which is yeah. Absolutely crazy. It sounds bizarre, doesn't it? I, yeah. I wouldn't have believed it if someone told me, but just go and Google it, 77th Battalion, and it's the Royal British Army website. It's amazing. So the questions, I'm just typing it down just to Google that afterwards, but uh, what I'll do as well is I'll try and find the stage notes and I'll put that on the show notes and the link to the NHS numbers as, as we spoke about as well, then uh, have a look for the 77th Battalion. So if anyone wants to check these out, they're freely available on the internet. Um, but we've got some questions come through, uh, another sort of like 10 minutes or so, if that's okay with you. Um, first off, it was that, how do I nominate him for a Human of the Year Award? The guy's got balls. But uh, Jamie, uh, in one of the groups I asked the questions, is saying, how long do you think we can sustain a shutdown economy before it gets really bad? Um, is there a time frame? Well, it is pretty bad now, but is it three months, six months? What's the best plan that you see to actually build things back up economically? Well, put it, put it this way, the, 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 uh, the Tories went on the austerity plan. And I think it took them, I think the austerity measures in the UK were going for 11 or 12 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. The money that they saved in those 11 or 12 years because of all the austerity measures, they blew in the first couple of months. So that's how much money we're talking about. So when you say, you know, how much longer can it go on? It can't. It's already gone on way too long. How, you, how an economy recovers from this, I don't know. And the government have said, well, um, there's going to be no, uh, no decrease in spending. Okay, well, there's going to be no de decrease in spending. There must therefore be increases in taxes. There's no other way of doing it. So you're going to have a situation where, first of all, unemployment is probably going to hit five and a half, six million. Whenever, even if we went back tomorrow, it would be five and a half million. Um, and, uh, and people are going to be taxed more. There are going to be less jobs, therefore more people on uh, unemployment benefit. There's going to be less tax because less people are paying tax. So the people who have got jobs are going to have to pay an awful lot more tax, whatever that might be, five pin pound, ten pin pound, I don't know. Um, and that will be paid for probably for a generation, you know. So this isn't... People think, oh, V-shaped recovery, it will be okay by 2008. It, it really won't. Um, so we haven't got any more time, basically. I think perhaps a better question would be, you know, how long can we be in lockdown before there's civil di disobedience? And I think the answer to that would probably be when the furlough checks run out. Yeah, and, and also the self-employed is only, a, I believe, with mine. I was just about to go limited, which is a good job I didn't. Um, but... Mm the um support for that i believe is the first of june so if they don't extend that then there'll be a lot of civil unrest or even more civil unrest when it comes to the first of june i believe for people getting very desperate with that uh on that note as well um kareen has asked which human right laws rights laws should we look into now that brexit has gone through so i believe this is kind of against the law with the human rights or they've tried to wipe human rights to a degree or something? 
There, there was a senior government, or used to be a senior government lawyer, that said they should suspend human rights whilst the um, whilst this coronavirus thing is going on because the government had made it impossible for the police, basically. But that was a recommendation from from somebody that hasn't actually gone through. So they haven't said that they're suspending human rights. Um, they just have. <laughs> yeah. They're not really so, going to brag about that sort of thing. No, but your human rights have been suspended. You can't right. go out of your house. You can't go visit your mum. You know, it's, what, more, what more basic rights could you want? Yeah, and I know definitely, I think we're, our birthdays are a day, like from in between. So you're the 20th, I'm the 21st. So we've got birthdays next week. It'd be great to spend that with my family. Is that going to happen? Not legally. And I think that they just look at it that way. Uh, again, there's a few people uh, thanking you. As always, uh, as we've said, is it possible to extend the action to include Wales? I'm assuming this is just England that you're going for. Yeah, and it was the, the reason Wales wasn't included, it's just a vagary of the law. Um, the Wales and Scotland just come under a different, they did a, a different thing, a slightly different thing that the, uh, the lawyer and the barrister at the time explained it. I can't quite remember what it was, but it wasn't that we were accepting what, that, that we were trying to. You know, not do Wales as it were. It's just that you would need two separate actions. Okay, so it's understandable that. Uh, can you compel Neil Ferguson to? This is probably before this actually came out when I asked the question. Can you compel Neil Ferguson to give evidence and Boris Johnson? No, it's a judicial review, so there's no um, witnesses or uh, experts or anything like that. So Wait, this is purely speaking. Sorry. Uh, you it's a completely unbiased side of like, people that are reviewing it, right? Yeah, so you've got the judges that are reviewing the evidence and the evidence is, is put before them in written form um, and then they'll decide what, whatever it is that they decide. But yeah, there's no cross-examinations of witnesses or anything as exciting as that, um, sadly, because that, that, uh, that would be quite exciting. But yes, no, we, we, there's nothing we can do about that. We can certainly bring the evidence, the Ferguson, the discredited Ferguson evidence, but we can't bring him. He's too busy elsewhere by the sounds of it. They're breaking a lot. <laughs> Possibly. Um, maybe he's uh, had a bit of a slap from, from his, uh, well, he hasn't got a missus, the other woman has got a guy now, but two more. Alice I think that's at least, that's, having a slap from his wife is at least of his worries, I think, at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it might be a positive for him. So Alison has asked, uh, can I also ask him whether he thinks Ferguson's code, which led to the lockdown, and which he is still not fully released, is subject to freedom of information as Ferguson was an advisor to government. Well, interestingly, when we sent the letter before action, um, we were asking for various bits of SAGE and, and so on to be released. And then a few, uh, few days after we put the letter before action in, uh, the whole thing with Ferguson happened. You know, they just happened to find him inviting his mistress in. Yep. Um, and then he, obviously he resigned because of it. And then the day after that, Imperial actually released the code. So that code has been released and Imperial released it the day after he got the sack. Oh, sorry, resigned. Um, so I, I feel as though they were prompted by what we, but why what we did. And it, and it does seem a little bit like Ferguson being thrown under the bus. I was going to um, ask, how does it feel like that? As it does to me. Well, I mean, the Paps would have been would have been camped outside his house. Now, whether that was a, you know, a necessary trade or not, and whether they should have been there or not, but they were, and they and he got caught. Um, but it, it does seem a little bit like discrediting him, doesn't it? I mean, I don't know if you remember the story with David Kelly in the Iraq War. It's got similar rings to it. Definitely, uh, I think the what avenues for compensation are open for those who've lost jobs and businesses if this draconian lockdown is declared illegal. Are there any at all or not? Um, well, yes, in short, you know, if it turns out that the government have, have acted outside of the law, then there would be, there would be a way of, uh, I'm sure, taking them to court again. You know, it, it would be a long process, but yeah. So, you, know, you, you prove loss. You know, the government has done something that's unlawful that's cost you money or in whatever way shape or form and therefore you would be entitled to compensation i believe but i'm not a lawyer or a barrister so um you need to take it i'm sure that would come out afterwards anyway. probably on a case by case um each case 
individually as well. So what are the suggested actions in place of lockdown and what are the projected tolls compared to lockdown and the ramifications such as an increase in suicides from a ruined economy? Well, I think we covered that earlier, you know, the, the, I don't think there's an expert alive that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't concur that there's going to be far more deaths caused by the lockdown than have ever been potentially saved by it. Rather than there's anybody, you know, even the government themselves, I think, said 150,000 people they expect to die because of it. So, <laughs> I, don't, I just don't get it. I, this is when it comes back in our case to the proportionality. It doesn't make any sense. You know, their, their whole duty is to protect life and they've actually endangered life. Yeah, and you look at the, the actual number at the moment. What, what is the actual number at the moment that they've been saying in comparison to predicted? Well, they make it as they go along, don't they? I mean, basically what they're saying now is, is that everybody who's died in excess of the rolling five-year average must be because of COVID, which is a nonsense. You know, average is a, a by definition average, and in some years you have higher than average, and other years you have lower than average. So if this is a year which is higher than average, well then, that's it. And this is only five years. You know, it's not a very good... Uh, average to take from any statistical point of view. Go back 20 years and actually this is no different to, or I think it's about the third biggest deaths over the last 20 years. Hardly compelling. They were pretty high in 2018 as well from what I could see. Um, yeah, I think there, there was 99, 2000 I think was pretty high. But I think it's third, I think it's the third highest, something like that. But yeah, 18 I think was pretty high. It's pretty crazy. Okay, just to wrap up, is there anything else that you want to go over that we haven't gone over in regards to letting people know what is going on with the the legal case um yeah i mean the the, the legal case it goes on it's not, it's not like a, a typical legal take case that goes on for years it will all happen quite quickly um and it, it's probably just worth reminding people you know this is not about sort of you know because i personally have lost some money or because businesses have lost some money and a few customers and stuff it's about a, at the heart of it, the fundamental question of whether it's right that the government has locked everybody up. You know, and we forget because people have been locked up, they're a bit kind of um, punch drunk now, I think. But you have been locked in your houses for eight weeks by, the, by government decree. It's essentially a malicious state. The police are um, patrolling up and down and telling you that you're not allowed to go in your own front garden and you can't do this and you can't do that. And that's actually what's happened. And this judicial review is basically saying, well, was that legal or not? And if it turns out that it's legal, that's that's huge ramifications because they can do it whenever they want so you know it, it's, it's a much bigger um concept i think than it probably first seems definitely and when you your legal team replied to the letter that the government have sent back can the government then hold fire for two weeks again or have they got a deadline to reply again or not no i think the next step is is that we just take them to court yeah so it should be pretty quick after after this. Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. Cool. Well, Simon, I really appreciate you for sparing the time to go through this. Uh, apologies for a little bit lower quality on the video with this. Um, there's obviously an overload on the broadband at the moment, but thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Yeah, welcome. It's been fun. Cheers. Thank you.